instead of doing a lot of what's called life force control uh, in the yogic culture, it's called pranayama. Okay, the working with the breath that draws that energy up up north to the crown of your head. Now, I wasn't doing it in an effort to doing it in an effort to create that experience. It's just part of conditioning of what you think of uh, metaphysically as conditioning the pranic tube or the energy body, the light body. I'm Charlie Castex on your, your superior self. Charlie, my man, thank you so much for taking the time. This is going to be an exciting conversation. Um, I wanted to have you back. You were on the show previously, like a couple of years ago. Um, and then going back over your work, I, I really wanted to reconnect and just have another conversation with you. So thank you for taking the time. Uh, my pleasure, Trey. It's great to be here with you. Great to, great to share with you. Sure. So I, I really want my audience to really have some context about uh, your path and your journey. Um, it is very, to me, it is very shamanistic. Um, if that's the word that we, um, that you would use, I don't know, but I feel like it's very organic and very relatable to the indigenous cultures that are in the United States. So what did your spiritual journey look like? When did you start becoming very curious to, uh, something higher to yourself and how did you pursue that at a very early age? Okay, sure. It's, uh, it's probably a whole episode unto itself, really. But uh, <laughs> very early on, I was uh, magnetically or gravitationally drawn to spirit, to the divine, to the mystical. And I come from a Roman Catholic background and family. So the first available platform for that, the first atmosphere that I found myself in was the church. And I was an altar boy. And... Uh, I actually loved it. I loved the, the whole feeling of the sacred and the mystical and the incense. And I found myself uh, performing masses in my room and playing with holy water and that kind of thing that my mother had. And I was um, always in, in kind of a, a sublimated quest for the divine. So first it started by being an altar boy. And uh, later on in my teenage years, I uh, in some ways just... You, you really can't you can't anticipate these kind of things happening in your life but i began an apprenticeship with a native american medicine man named sunbear who's really well known in our culture um, and that was a four-year journey with him and then a six-year journey with uh, richard sparrow eagle who's a lakota holy man so it's about a 10-year apprenticeship with these two heavy-duty medicine men um that was uh really an extraordinary experience and um so during that time, it was several years of being with both of them and lots of ceremony and lots of traveling and lots of medicine wheel gatherings and that kind of thing. Um, and the progression from Sparrow Eagle to actually from Sun Bear to Sparrow Eagle, right in, a, in the middle of my time with Sparrow Eagle, which was about six years, like so many people, I had uh, the book Autobiography of a Yogi found me. I could find so many people, the teachings of Yogananda. Um, and before it, before I know it, then I'm being initiated uh, into a whole other world of Native American Indians, East Indian, and um, and honest to God, Maharaja is what how we think of it in our culture. Um, initiated me then in, in my twenties, um, so it's just gone on from there, and I've been you know, blessed to to share that inspiration and, and guidance with people. Sure. So what's the difference between the um, the Indians of America and then the Indians of the, of the East, right? Like, are there belief systems? I know there's obviously differences, but what are the commonalities? Yeah, what are the commonalities? That's a, that's a, a really good question. It's a great point to hang on. The commonalities are the connection of, of going within, of connecting to the divine within, um, I think the commonalities are that there is connection to sound and chanting as a means to what we think of in maybe human potential realm or neuroscience as getting our brain waves entrained, uh, slowing down the brain waves or even upping the frequency of the body through chant, through ceremony. Um, and 
the indigenous folks have this kind of pantheistic worldview where they see the divine and the animate world as synonymous, the same thing. And I think it's true um, in the East Indian cultures as well, in the Vedanta and yogic culture. It's just that rather than saying, um, okay, that divinity is, is nature and nature is divinity, the East Indians have been at it for so long in their civilization that all of these human attributes and projections of identity and, and um, psychological overlay, if you will, has been placed onto their gods. So very, uh, they're perceived as kind of a polytheist, polytheistic culture where there's so many different gods, but really um, I think it's arguably, uh, we could arguably say that in the yogic culture, it's not that, there is really one supreme being. It's seen that all these different manifestations or diversification of divinity is there. So there's a lot of commonality in that sense. Mm -hmm. Now, the medicine um, journeys that you experienced, was that with like psychedelics? Another good question. No, no. Nope. Uh, there's no psychedelics involved. Uh, of course, there's the traditional perspective, especially in the Southwest of the peyote ceremonies and that kind of thing. Um, I never partook in any of that. It, it just it just never happened for me and, and it never called to me either. So uh, the ceremonies were more, from my experience, really trustable in the subjective sense because all the experience I was having transcendently was from within myself. So that is more connected to, uh, to, to put a bead on it or put a spotlight on it is the the aspect of say vision quest where you go out on the land and you're out on the hill and you fast and you pray um, and um, that was uh, a, a tremendous experience for me sure so <laughs> you're well known for having psychic gifts right and helping people push through you know unconscious barriers and how, allowing them to see um, what is holding them back now when you were making these transitions through these different cultures is that what developed your psychic powers or were you naturally born with these um, abilities mm, yes i think i was naturally born with it um i i think it's a curious feature that for a lot of people that are really sensitive intuitive or psychic they often develop or uh, those skills become more fleshed out they become more solidified through going through a really traumatic childhood. So actually in many ways, uh, being a survivor of abuse and, and all of that kind of thing, actually I think had more to do with developing my psychic ability than necessarily the spiritual journey. Although these days when I'm guiding people, I see spiritual empowerment and intuitive development as hand in glove. You know, the more empowered you are spiritually, the more intuitive you become, the more intuitive you become, the more connected you are to your source, to your heart, to your spirit, to the grace you know, that, that's breathing us right now. So, uh, yeah, it's definitely, it definitely helped facilitate it, this aspect of delving down the rabbit hole of, of spirituality and mysticism definitely uh, turned up the volume on the intuition because you're sensing from the inside out when you're more connected to the spiritual process you're really living more from the inside out so you're listening internally you're feeling internally you're looking internally and you're focusing internally so how could we not be more intuitive mm -hmm. a question keeps popping out in my mind um so usually i have to follow that so you go from catholicism and those different rituals and practices right. uh, orthodoxy and then you go into the more the organic natural shamanistic and animistic type of traditions like why the jump like what was it like did you just like feel like there was more of a connection to those different types of uh belief systems or traditions like why would you go from one end of the spectrum to the other yeah it's such a great question um and it helps me clarify it in my own mind and, and see it through okay um well i think there was fundamentally a real dissatisfaction with the sense of uh, re a religious paradigm in the, in the, you can think of it in the model of having a middleman between me and the divine, between the individual and the all. 
And I think there was, you know, fu this fundamental dissatisfaction of like, I feel this connection to spirit and it's, it's so beautiful. Um, but it also felt like a box, felt like a big box. So what happened historically was my eldest sister was 10 years older than me. She was reading Carlos Castaneda and she came across this book by Sun Bear called The Path of Power. And it was an autobiography of his journey. Um, it's still out there. It's not in print, but it's still a popular book. And so she lent it to me. She said, I haven't read this book by this man named Sun Bear. You may want to read this. Now, when I started reading it, Trey, it felt like a postcard to my future. I was like, I got halfway through it and I started over again. And I, that was just resonant. Um, I knew that whatever I was reading there was, was my life, my future. And what really appealed to me was that lack of middleman, that, that sense of direct connection with the divine, um, especially through, through physicality, through matter, through nature. Um, and I was so inspired uh, with that feeling that there wasn't any limit to how deep this process could be and that it didn't have to be just a psychological um, exercise. And it certainly wasn't an exercise in, in redemption. You know, people come to spiritual process for so many reasons. Um, the classical one being you know, redemption and fulfillment and um, some people come to it for ascension or heal mommy and daddy issues, or they're lumping the spiritual process in with ETs and angels. And, and, and maybe, maybe all of that, but to me, it's that direct experience of the divine that's most satisfying. So that book in particular put me in the direction or the trajectory of pursuing the apprenticeship with Sun Bear. Mm. And then there was like a part in your story where like you had to go out and do like some type of solo journey like in the woods, right? And Definitely. it seems like it was, you know, the way that you describe it is something similar to what I've heard. I've heard about um, indigenous cultures in Australia where they do a walkabout, where the person goes on their own and journeys throughout the outback. Did you, you did something similar here, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, the vision quests can span anywhere from like one night on the hill to three or four nights. And depending on which tradition or, um, cultural uh, packaging you have in terms of the indigenous spirituality. It, it, you could be with, with water or without water or you know, fasting entirely. Um, my experiences uh, with Sun Bear were, I think it was a three, three to four day time on the hill. Um, one of the really dramatic processes in the apprenticeship program was actually being buried in the ground overnight. Wow. And, earth yeah in the earth mother i shouldn't say the ground and in that right wow because especially at 18 it was like, what are we doing you're given a shovel <laughs> and you predetermine your spot on the mountain and um and you dig yourself a hole big enough for your body and you get to the point where your arms are just kind of loose enough so that you can fill it in up to your neck and effectively, the, the objective is to be there overnight and to really you know, intimately through and through, through your pores, uh, what we think of as interoception uh, through sensing within, you're, you're absolutely connecting with the planet. Yeah. Mm, or so, digging your grave. Yeah, or to, <laughs> but it, it, it's, uh, it really it does evoke that aspect of, wow, what am I doing? You know, kind of mortal fear, especially in the middle of the night. And um, like, imagine that there's creepy crawlies, you know, you don't have, your hands aren't available, something wants to take residence in your ears or your nostrils. So uh, it's challenging on a lot of levels for people to get over themselves and say, all right, I'm going to connect with the divine, connect with the earth mother and feel that power and feel that, that intensity in your body. Wow. So your experience with these different altered states of consciousness or non-ordinary states of consciousness through chanting, through uh, medicine journeys that are not psychedelics, have you experienced different dimensions and or archetypes that supported um, the spirits that uh, these individuals, not I wouldn't say worship, but work with? Mm. Wow, that's, a, uh, that's another really fascinating question. Um, 
yes. I think the answer is yes, but it's not in in, in not in a particularly externalized way, like where there was a uh, archetypal uh, force, like say one of the wind directions or something like that, or, that came to me. Um, I'll give you an example and a specific that I shared in one of my video events recently that was very profound for me. So when I was on the with my second teacher, Sparrow, the little Lakota holy man, and we were I was out on the on the butte, put out in the circle, as we call it. One of the things is I asked him before he was putting me on the circle um, up on the hill, and, he, and I said, What if a snake comes into my circle? Because there's no tent on this one, you know, there's no food, water, no tent, nothing. You're just right out in the elements. And he said, Well. I don't know what to tell you, brother, if your faith is lukewarm. <laughs> he said, you should be able to take the snake, if it's a poison snake, lift it up, put it out of the circle. So, oh, okay, here we go. So for me, Trey, wow, this is one experience of many, and hopefully this will shed some light on it. Um, we talk about direction, direct connection to the divine versus an archetypal kind of presentation. It's all the divine, it's all infinite, it's within and without, there's nothing it isn't. And even that which we call dark matter or akash or space is it, is the divine. So I'm, I'm out on the, on the butte under the stars and I'm praying my heart out. And the next thing I notice, the, the stars light up with this luminescence like I'd never seen before. And I started asking existential questions, like what is the nature of time, and what is karma, and what is my incarnation about, and what are, what are human beings really? And I'm, I'm kind of riffing on what I probably asked at the time, because I don't remember specifically the whole download of questions. But the question machine that I am, and that most of us are, well, I let it rip. Now, in that constellation that I was looking at above my head, all of a sudden, equations formulate. It was just like being in, say, uh, some kind of fifth dimensional aspect of uh, goodwill hunting or beautiful mind where all of a sudden the equations are there answering everything. And here's the thing. I'm probably one of the least mathematical people on the planet, but I understood every answer in those equations and they would just stretch across the sky. So I kept asking and I kept asking and I kept asking and asking. And hours later, I got, I was like, Ooh, okay. It was almost like, have you had enough? And I was exhausted. And I realized that logic has its limits. And, the, and what I really realized wasn't a thought, it was a realization, was that, you know, the, the, the cosmos is set up mathematically, obviously, in a quantum sense. But beyond the mathematics of it, beyond logic, is the mystical. Mm. Right? That's where the mystical is. And that's what I came up with it. So I surrendered to it, realizing I don't need to keep asking more questions. You know? And what I ultimately found in my experience is that I, like every other human being, is an answer to which there is no question. <laughs> that's so beautiful. So like when you ask what is, what is our purpose here on earth, it came out as X equals blah, 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 point something, something. Incredibly elaborate equation, but the, bizarre and transcendent aspect of it was I understood the answers. <laughs> wow. Yeah, without any sense of, I don't have a clue about algebra or anything. <laughs> so the stars were aligning to those equations and and giving you the answers so like the stars would for, like come together and form answers yeah, for you. Yeah, the, storms, uh, the stars rather were illuminated and I, I guess you could say superimposed over that constellation was a kind of luminescent equation that would string out across the horizon and then as soon as i was given the answer to one of those i, I said okay that's great now that i know everything and then i'm like well i need to know this i need to know that i need to know that but again i finally discovered uh in a good way that there's a limitation to logic mm -hmm. you know there really is it's a, it's a tough thing i think for westerners and i'm i'm pretty damn cerebral um but it, it's a beautiful thing to realize there's much more to us than the gray matter and the intellect. Sure. And that's when we get into the mystical. Did you ever think like maybe you're having some type of interaction with like some ETs or some type of non-human intelligences? Good question. Um, it, no, it didn't occur to me that way. Um, because 
I've been fortunate to have so many experiences, even as a really young child. Again, we really could riff on this indefinitely. <laughs> it's strange, you know, maybe there'll be a story about it at some point. Um, but I, I've had the experience of connecting with, um, with higher beings and columns of light and what we would consider maybe in our par- in metaphysical parlance as the Akashic records um, and those kind of divine experiences as a child. But I didn't have any sense of this personification of that divine, like it was an ET or some, um, you know, extraterrestrial power. It, it, to me, it was um, it, it was the the same energy that was stood in my blood, mm. and that, in my food. That's how I relate to it. At the time. Sure. What what are your what are the thoughts of the indigenous tribes regarding ETs? Mm. Well, it's something that I guess it would be good to preface this by saying I, um, I've i always felt like I could connect with them somehow, and I didn't really want to. <laughs> Not for any you know negative reason, but it was just never fascinating to me enough. I just felt like if I connected with them, that's going to open up a whole other, whole other Pandora's box. So I, I purposely, um, and I've had... Uh, sightings, I guess you could say, um, never close encounters, um, but I've had sightings of UFOs and felt their presence. So um, with my Native American teachers, I could see that, well, they related to them as kind of guardians out there in the cosmos. And, you know, their perspective was, or at least the perspective I took away, was that they're kind of at a distance for a reason, that we need to be on our own, we need to develop our free will, we need to develop our consciousness. And I related to that kind of narrative that um, it, wasn't, it, it wasn't necessary to invoke them for say a, um, you know, some sort of intervention. You know, although uh, mm-hmm. if you look at our society and culture and the planet at large or the planetary time we're in right now, it, we sure look like we need an intervention. <laughs> but the uh, Native Americans that I was connected to, they, I think they honored them as part of like the Star Brothers. That's kind mm-hmm. of the perspective. Like those are the Star Brothers. And they're out there, but we're supposed to be here. We're supposed to be here in density connecting with the, with the planet. And they're more connected to either the Ethere or you know, some other atmosphere besides Gaia, besides planet Earth. Sure. So how do you think our consciousness differs from that, theirs? I can only uh, speculate on that. Sure. How about speculation? <laughs> I mean, I, I, I have no knowledge of that. That's what I'm saying. So uh, and no direct experience. So I, I couldn't say. Um, but if we were speculating, I would imagine that they're not too dissimilar to us in the sense that I imagine there's a continuum or a spectrum of consciousness from um, all the way from being very identified with time, with the body, uh, with their environments, all the way to what we would think of as a a divine consciousness, a type of super conscious state of awareness of unity with everything. So I would imagine there's a spectrum of consciousness. I think it's probably human nature to just presuppose that they're all enlightened beings and that they're all beneficent and they're all here to help humanity. And I'd like to think that, but we just don't know. Sure. I'm really curious, man, Charlie, how do you experience reality? Like how do you experience (laughs) everyday reality? Like how, like your field of vision, like your experiences, like, are you seeing different dimensions? Like I'm very curious. Mm, Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's it's a great question. It's just difficult because how can you, First of all, the mystical is something that can't be described or defined, really, in its essence. How could you? I mean, that's the nature of it. It's non-physical, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, people can argue that, but that, my experience is that it can't be described physically. So, yeah, my life is different uh, in the sense that it's very energetic. Um, I, I'm very connected to, to bliss, to ecstasy, um, to what I consider as grace without any particular religious connotation to see it as life. I think, I don't believe there's anything larger than life. We use that expression, but think about it. Like there's nothing larger than life. So my experience of um, existence 
Do I, do I experience different dimensions? I suppose so. You know, I don't really think of them dimensionally. Um, I don't really think in terms of dimensions. Uh, but the, the experience of, of grace, of oneness, of divinity um, is, is very tangible and palpable for me. Hmm. I love that. I um, lights. Let's we all say that too. If you want to give it like kind of some sort of, um, you know, if you want to take it out of the abstract. I see a lot of light. I see a lot, a lot of, of mystics have said that, you know, yeah. even like Yogananda have said, has said that. Yeah. That uh, we're all light, right? Like when he had that out of body experience, like his, his his entire room was filled with light, and he could see like light in everything. And there's been many people that have had out of body ex experiences where that was the case, where they had some type of experience with light. I think it will. I can't. Michael Beckwith, I think, describes how he he gets in these states of bliss. So maybe it's samadhi. I'm not sure. But he says that he's blinded by the light and he can't see anything but the light. And then he has these moments of like euphoria, bliss, I mean, whatever, joy, yeah. uh, abundance, like all of these different states of, of well-being. It's just it's just interesting that that's the commonality is that it's light. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I can share with you because we're here to share. Um, I mentioned reading Yogananda's book. Well, talk about a postcard in the future, but I'm not alone there. So many people, that seems to be this kind of leap motif, so to speak, this perennial theme that runs through this cross-section of humanity of people awakening in consciousness that they somehow either inf are influenced by Yogananda or connected to people that have been. <laughs> and so point being that uh, I just got it. I just got it. I fell into that book and I started immediately focusing on my third eye. And we think of it now, maybe in our uh, things are really advanced in, uh, in terms of spirituality being mainstream. Of, we'd say pineal activation or that kind of thing, pineal gland activation. And I remember being um, in my early 20s at that same sister's house in my eldest sister's house. And it was the, maybe about two o'clock or so in the morning and I was meditating. And I was determined. I, I saw in, in autobiography, Yogananda talked about this. Like, if you come to the divine with one point, at, one point in this, and we could think of it as with the heart of a child and without cheat and deceit, as it's supposedly been said in the, in the Gita. I've never found it in there. Maybe it's in the Upanishads or the Vedas. But either way, if you come to that divine, uh, which you are already, but you place your attention on it full. I mean, that's the thing. It's not something other than you. And you'd be surprised what happens. So for me, here I am, gosh, what about 23? And I'm meditating and I'm focusing on the, this point between, slightly above the eyes with sheer intensity. And the next thing I know, yeah, there's my first experience of being taken in the light. And uh, what was so, you know, so profound about that experience is the, the realization of how real this is. And that happens with every mystical experience. You realize, wow, this is not abstract. This is not conjecture. It's not imagination. It's really real. And it's so real that I came back to my sensory body, my physical sense of self. And my ego had a difficult time <laughs> integrating that, you know, trying to understand that, coming from that state of bliss, that state of samadhi and the light, which was as... Uh, Brother Beckwith says, and completely blinding in so many ways. Mm -hmm. that's well, that's not, that's not the first time, right? Like, you, oh, I guess it might have been the first time, but there was a second time or a third time where you're actually struck by the light, lightning, right? Yeah. Um, well, the lightning experience was just last year. Yeah, I was actually struck by lightning. So, um, <laughs> again, for the well informed metaphysical uh, audience and, and empowered seekers, they may be familiar with the idea of the koshas or the different bodies. It's a yogic concept uh, and uh, a reflection of truth within that paradigm of knowledge. And uh, it, the, the basis of that understanding is that there's five different sheaths that cover the Atman or the, or the soul. Now, again, I think it's silly to superimpose this as a physical idea, but the truth of it remains that the, what we're looking at with each other here is a food body. It's a it's an assemblance of food and matter. And then there's subtler bodies from there. Um, in the experience of being struck by lightning, I 
experienced a vast uh, confusion of electromagnetic energy that expanded what's called the pranamaya kosha, or one of the, the subtle bodies, the energy body, one of the energy bodies. Um, so that was very dramatic and, um, and beautiful. And uh, it was so uh, striking for me in many ways. You know, <laughs> yeah. uh, because I was walking through a threshold, I was walking through a porch door here. And, and when that happened, uh, you know, after, this is such an important point, after realizing that I'm still alive in this physical sense, my next thought was, wow, now this is, I, I don't know exactly, but probably several million volts of electricity. My next thought was, wow, that was only a fraction of the electrical energy I experienced in my Kundalini awakening, which was in 2018. So again, I have too many experiences. And um, this is what you get for being a guy for almost 30 years who hasn't wanted to talk about his own experiences. <laughs> but, but now it's, it's fine because I think people, if you're inspired by it, or if we realize that these options are available. But this is, again, human potential and spiritual awakening. They're synonymous. I think if you're interested in one, the other will happen. But my point is, all that electrical energy uh, that I had in the lightning strike was really just a fraction of the energy that, that released from the base of my tailbone and shot up to my brain. And that energy is within everybody's spine. Wow. So. <clears throat> wow. It is. You whole, can't. <laughs> so you felt all of that the entire like you didn't pass out during the lightning strike like you were conscious for the entire thing that's right i was conscious during it and i was conscious enough i was conscious enough uh in such a fortunate way to be well, literally conscious literally aware to let go of the door handle that was metal otherwise i would have had a different experience so it didn't ground out entirely through my feet the electricity went hit my left hand all the way up the arm into the back of my brain. And um, speaking of the, the, the mystical states that we have as mystics, um, there's a lot of electrical energy in the brain. So I'm used to that, but it created kind of a sense of a headache there in the, in the hind brain. Um, it was a, a, a complete uh, you know, supernatural amount of electrical energy being kind of put into the, into the base of my back of my brain. So, yeah, I hope that I hope that answers it in some way. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, well, so you had a Kundalini awakening in 2018, which to you felt like it was more pal palpable than the actual being struck by lightning, which is who knows, uh, you know, millions of volts. I don't know. Yeah, right. Just point that out, right? Yeah, me too. So, what's the difference, right, in experience, right? Like if if the Kundalini awakening is so much more powerful. Like, what did you experience after or during that that was so much different than the lightning strike? Yeah, yeah, excellent. Well, qualitatively, uh, worlds apart, because let's just start with the lightning strike. That wasn't itself a spiritual experience in the sense of a mystical experience. It was a phenomenological experience where whereas all of that electromagnetic energy entered into my food body, my physical body, the Anamaya Kosha, if we're talking about these, these different um, sheaths or bodies. And so that's a lot of electrical information, but it's physical. Okay, that's physical. Now, you can also say that the electrical information within the spine is physical. Sure, we can call it that too. And it's also fair to say that everything physical is also spiritual. It's true, because it really is two sides of the same coin. There isn't two different things. It's just a degree of density, a degree of fineness, degree of frequency, vibration, um, and frequency being the rapidity or the, the speed of that vibration. So the, the vast difference was the electrical information in getting struck by lightning was something that I had to integrate um, as a phenomenological physical experience to have it be spiritually incorporated. It wasn't like, oh, okay, I get blasted by lightning and I saw the light and I'm connected in a higher state of consciousness. It's very, very physical. What I did with that information to me felt spiritual, you know, to, to incorporate it, to take it into the psyche, to, you know, experience the, the electric handshake. It's like being struck by the gods, you know, and to take that in and say, okay, 
can this can I leverage this to my spiritual evolution? Can I grow from this? It, with that intention, then it became spiritualized. Flashback to 2018, that experience to share it for, with you because it, people usually love hearing about these kind of things. I think for good reason. In fact, if it hadn't happened to me, I would love to hear a story about this, you know. So I'm, <laughs> I'm laying in bed after a particularly uh, non-eventful meditation. And interestingly, I was kind of agitated that night, um, which isn't that common for me. Um, and the point there is like people are, oh, you don't have to be in this great state to have a mystical experience. Maybe not. You know, maybe it'll take you by surprise when you're in a bad mood or something. So in the middle of the night, I, I meditation and went to sleep middle of the night. It felt like somebody was pushing me back and forth in the bed, like back and forth. And I'm deeply asleep and I'm flailing back and forth. And I'm thinking, starting to become conscious out of deep sleep. And I think my wife, Catherine, why would she be shaking me back and forth? Like and the next thing I thought, I thought, no, she's sleeping in the other room tonight. And, uh, and she wouldn't do that anyway. And, and I start to wake up and I, my body's just flailing back and forth, just particularly from my lower body. And just about the time that I actually start waking up, this is just a couple of seconds. I realized the energy in my tailbone or the coccyx. And I had heard about this. I heard about this for decades that it's like a freight train. And it's actually a good analogy, although it doesn't, like again, I can't really describe it, but it's a good analogy because I felt that freight train of energy and I went and an exemplative came out and I went, oh, because <laughs> I, I knew that was it. And that was my last thought. I thought, that's it. This is my last moment on earth. But like that, that was it. I'm going to die because that energy shot up. And when it shot up to my heart, it stopped my heart. And from there, yeah, I entered a super conscious experience where there was no separation. There was no duality. There was no subject object relationship any longer for quite some time. So that kind of experience of merging with the divine is very rarefied. Um, although, I, again, it's nice to play devil's advocate with ourselves here. Um, this is a thinking man's and, and, and the heart man's show um, that this ex these kind of experiences are more available than ever. People are waking up faster than ever. Consciousness is more available than ever. So it's not just the realm of yogis and mystics and you know uh, wise men or or elders. And so point being, when all of that happened, I was, I was in the state of grace for a long time before I came back. And when I came back, I knew I was coming back to my own consciousness and individuality because I was in a lucid dream. And I went, ah, oh, and I was flying in a lucid dream and I started seeing spirit animals and all this kind of thing. I was, wow, okay, so I'm still here. I'm still alive. And um, the amazing thing, speaking of your superior self, I'm, I'm pretty proud of it. <laughs> a few hours later, you know, I got a few hours sleep. I get up, I'm on the couch with my wife having coffee, telling her what happened. And she's crying, saying, well, this is, this is just so amazing. You know, this is like, she's so happy for me that this experience happened. And then we look at each other and we know there's about 30 minutes before I'm got to go into the office and do a reading for somebody. <laughs> and there was that thought of, should I do it? And it's like, yeah, just like the day after 14 hours after being struck by lightning, I did a um, podcast, a White Shores podcast uh, out of London, England. And I just, because I thought to myself, well, I can do it. So I might as well do it. And actually it was a really good show. <laughs> so yeah, what, what is this life as a mystic? I don't, I, it's definitely not for everybody. Um, and I think it, it happens to people who aren't looking for it. Uh, which is paradoxical. I mean, I, I never really I set out on the spiritual journey. It wasn't like I was looking for some kind of profound experience of light or divinity or, or necessarily seeking samadhi states or something like that. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's just so fascinating. I feel like, um, and you get, my daughter's getting ready to pop in, um, being struck by lightning and having to find a spiritual relationship between that actual event and where you are at consciously. Like, how did you integrate that into your spirituality? Like you said, being struck or being having a handshake with, with the gods, like how did you make it a spiritual event? Wow. Wow. It's great. Um, I chose to, 
I chose to relate to it as an initiation. That's that's the direct answer. I chose to look at it like, okay, you just absorbed this megavolts of energy and electricity. Is that going to be leveraged towards bringing it up into the higher centers of my body and my being um, it, or, or not? And so I think it's mainly the, the intention that, that catalyzes an experience like that. Um, having the willingness to actually absorb the energy I think it's the ultimate metaphor for the willingness of surrender to the, to the divine. You see, it, this is, gets rich, Trey. I, I believe it gets really rich because so many people are just running, running, running. I want to have a mystical experience. I want to have transcendent experience. It's like they're kind of forcing the gates, you know. I see it the other way. I see it like <clears throat> that you're like a fish. A spiritual seeker is like a fisherman or a fisherwoman, if you will. And you're casting that line out, okay? You cast that line out, you keep casting it out. I want to catch the fish. Of course you do. But you may never suspect that you'll catch a fish bigger than your boat. And that's been the story of my life. Is like, how do you make space for that kind of grace? How do you have capacity to be in exalted states of union, of samadhi, and be in the post office? I mean, I've had shock activation happen, you know, waiting online at the grocery store, you know, and experience, uh, you know, to transcendent mystical experiences happening as a, just about daily experiences multiple times a day. So how does one prepare body and mind to integrate in physical reality into uh, duality, if you will, you know, successfully? I think that that's the challenge. That's something I'm still very much learning about. And as I learn about it, I'm, I'm interested in teaching other people and how to be functional and how to be strong and stabilized in that degree of energy and consciousness. I think that's more the question because otherwise, as we've seen, and Ram Das used to talk about this, you know, otherwise people can become a yo-yo. They get high, you know, whether it's from a psychedelic or an internal experience, but they get high and then they crash back down and it's like, there's a tremendous challenge of orienting your individuality and your personality uh, back into your experience. And I know my first few samadhi states <clears throat> were absolutely, uh, it's like the reason I had those states was because I was kind of torn apart with the longing for God. And then you have that inexpressible unity with, with the divine. And then it's how do you reconcile your silly little personality and all your hangups and all your, your nonsense and your crap to that and your history and your, you know, your narrative definitely took me a minute. And that's thankfully I've been very galvanized to different teachers and a lot of support. So that's a long, a long response. I love it. I love it, dude. Um, what, so going back to the Kundalini awakening, and having you know this energy travel up your spine to your and into your heart center. Like, what are some of the misconceptions about the Kundalini awakening? Should people be trying to have these experiences? How do they how do they set the container for those? And did you set, did how did you prepare for that? Were you having a special diet? Were you fasting? Were you doing anything special that induced that? Yeah, yeah. There's a couple of questions in there, right? Um, okay, so let me let me touch on the first one about how people could maybe were you asking how they could evoke something like that sure or how can them? they set the container yeah how can they set the container great phrase well i think the the way to look at it is you're raising fundamental energy out of <clears throat> just think of yourself as like kind of a human monolith you're you're this vertical structure a vertical building and so much of your life force energy is contained just by virtue of being on terra firma in the centers that deal with survival, that deal with the animal, you know, eating, procreating, sleeping, you know, living, working, all that. So much of that energy is just balled up. It's completely concentrated in that lower part of the spine. So if you're starting to pull that up, one way that you can prepare that container is start 
living if, as you can out of just the matrix of your thought and emotion. In other words, get out of your private Idaho or at least create some distance between yourself and that private Idaho, that little sense of like, here's me and my story and my comings and my doings. And, you know, the, the great, uh, the, the stuff of mice and men to get out of the way of that through silencing, through quieting, um, and checking in, asking yourself, okay, what, what are you really after here? You know, if you, cause if you're just wanting an experience, um, a high, a thrill, there's so many ways to do that. If you're wanting to know yourself, then that's a different agenda. Mm -hmm. So you're creating a, a container to prepare for a greater experience. When you start living from the center of your being, from your heart more so, more connected to aspiring to love, to uh, being more inclusive, more receptive, more transparent to the transcendent, as Joseph Campbell would say, when we aspire to that, we're already moving, moving the energies out of just this kind of individual little prison of self. Uh, now with myself, what I think facilitated that experience in retrospect was I was doing a lot of what's called life force control, uh, is the, the English way of saying it, and um, in the yogic culture, it's called pranayama, okay? The working with the breath and life force control and moving the breath of the spine. I was doing a yogic breathing technique, pranayama, that draws that energy up, up north to the crown of your head. Now, I wasn't doing it in an effort to, doing it in an effort to create that experience. It's just part of conditioning of what you think of uh, metaphysically as conditioning the pranic tube or the energy body, the light body, which is, the non-physical parallel uh, of the spinal axis. It's the non-physical reflection of what we think of as the physical spine. Question on that? Yeah, because uh, I've I've had certain type of meditation exercises where I, I flex the muscles in that space and those chakras, and then like trying to push the energy up to the brain, top of the head. And then after I do that, there is like some type of tingling or something in the brain, right? Like it feels yeah. different. So I'm assuming that's not a Kundalini awakening, but it's some type of energy moving up and down. Like what is an, a marker that you're on the right path of like possibly having this type of awakening? Um, it, does it get more intense with the energy that gets into the brain? How do we um, strengthen that effort? Is it by semen retention? Is it by diet? Like, are we on the, like, can you give me like a, a signpost that, you know, yeah. things are going the way they should? Okay. Yeah. Again, fantastic question. Really. Um, you know, today, yeah, the semen retention is a, a kind of becoming more of a modern Western way of looking at it. I, I think that could be really helpful. Okay. Because first of all, we get um, very centered around and, and our culture is kind of in some ways just inculcated us consciously or unconsciously to just, okay, we get all that energy. We feel all that biologic energy and there's that horniness at, which is the energy that creates life. So how sacred is that? Okay. That fluid, that energy creates life. So that, that energy is there and it's, Oh my God, that's you know, a lot of energy. And we just want to jettison it. We just want to release it, release it, release it. Well, in the East, it's not just the, the yoga culture, but in the far east across the board, they see it the other way of like, hold on to it, hold on to it for a minute, integrate it, transmute that sexual energy, bring it up the spine. So yeah, I think that's super helpful. Um, diet is a good question. It, I think it's trickier because there's so much bio-individuality, okay? Um, I think that, you know, it's trickier to say, okay, there's one specific diet that will help. I... I think it's more along the lines of, of constancy, consistency, having practices that where you interiorize your focus, where you're taking all your five senses and reversing them. That's the essence of meditation, no matter the, the stylized approach to it. Mm -hmm. Where we keep looking in within, keep looking within, what happens is more of the life force energy starts to stabilize within the self, out of just the psychology and out of just the biological imperative. Okay, um, creating a constancy of practice is super helpful. 
Um, if you want to look at physical means that support it, I'm big on earthing or grounding, getting your feet on the earth and stabilizing your electromagnetic field. You know, and earthing's become really popular, but just think about how indigenous people were always barefoot. You know? mm -hmm. um, I, I think that the idea of getting out of, well, sensing, 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 sense, sensing, we can call it feeling, but not feeling in the sense of emotion, which we could consider dramatization of feeling, but feeling as in sensing, sensing, sensing. When we sense and feel internally successfully, we're really sensing internally. The frontal lobe, the neocortex actually dials down you know, the part, the executive function of the brain that's always solving problems. So that's, I think, a chief way to start preparing the container. Yeah. Mm, I love that. And then I'm going to get a little um, out there for you in left field. So I, I read Shri M's book um, about his journey and his path. And he talks about some type of, I don't know, some entity, a Naga, maybe some type of snake like being. Have oh, you no. ever had any? Yeah. Have you ever? And I'm probably mispronouncing that. Uh, but have you ever had experiences like with your teachers, with your gurus? of different entities or non-human intelligences that are out there that are similar to that experience that he describes in the book? Mm, yeah. Um, I think the good broad stroke answer is no. Mm. Yeah, and, and, and I'm actually grateful for that. Um, see, I've had the, the, so the personification of the divine that comes in within archetypal kind of structure or languaging like Naga for our listeners that may not be familiar. It's a term for the sacred serpent. Okay. And it's pretty synchronistic if you think about it, because I mean, what a nice segue. We're talking about Kundalini, which is really called the coiled serpent. And this kind of, when we see the caduceus in medicine today, that speaks to the interlacing of the masculine and feminine energies, uh, Shiva and Shakti. And so in the same sense, the, the snake is really the primordial and kind of, uh, hmm, wow, classic symbol of not only creation, but also the divine, curiously enough, um, before mm. it was kind of put into, a, before it was demonized. <laughs> okay, so um, no, I, not that sense of archetypal uh, beings or angelic beings necessarily. Well, um, let me ask you this. Do you think there are some, some type of entities or species like a reptilian culture that that are amongst us like i've been just kind of like you know listening to some psychics and some different people talking about their experiences and they think that there is some type of hidden culture or species walking amongst us that is basically empowering not empowering us excuse me, entrapping us uh or keeping us down to where we don't evolve as consciousness yeah. and um you know i i think it when I think of someone, you know, holding us down by the neck, I'm thinking about, you know, higher institutional, you know, powers, uh, the, the 100 families that are in charge of large, big industry, you know, big pharma and things like that, that have huge influence on, on the earth, right? I'm, I'm not necessarily thinking about a species that may or may not be human, but I, I just assume that it's human beings doing this to ourselves. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, the, the, if I could, can I just answer that last question just a little bit before we launch into that? 100%. Go ahead. Great. Okay. Because I think it may be helpful for our listeners because it's like, okay, there's Naga or people, saints have experienced certain, like somebody will experience the Divine Mother. Or for me, it's actually been when there is personification, it's been connected to masters. It's been connected to Jesus. It's been connected to Baba G. It's been connected to Yogananda. That's where my, my sense of complete connection and experience, uh, where there was personification of it, or there is, it's not past tense, thank God. Um, it, it, it's that internal link with, with, with these, these masters, I guess what would be considered well, either Maha avatars or, or um, avatars for humanity. So I just wanted to answer that because it deserves an answer. Um, sure. Yeah. Now, as far as the whole thing, you know, that's a fascinating subject. Um, and I'm, I'm going to give you a boring answer. I, 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 I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know. It's not. 
Um, I think it's an interesting thing to speculate on. I don't dismiss it, and yet I don't endorse it. I'm just so much within my own track. Um, I'm really keen on people not being too distracted. Um, so, and not that it has to be a distraction, but I just, um, I think it can be a rabbit hole that we go down where we're really just kind of going into a state of defensiveness and again into survival and uh, maybe even, you know, objectifying the enemy and all this kind of stuff. I've, Creating more division, right? Um, uh, not, exactly. You know, now that, you know, uh we it's not that we it's not enough we fight amongst ourselves now we're creating a whole nother species to fight with right like um yeah could be could be could and maybe be. yeah i think it's a really interesting thing for a lot of people to speculate on because it but how can we really know and i think that's what's so cool about spiritual process and empowerment is it's really about you know the direct experience of truth the direct experience of grace and so you can know it it's not philosophy it's not something that you know um, or it's not theory. So mm -hmm. there's there's a lot of phenomenological, I mean, worlds, uh, cosmos filled with phenomenological curiosities, UFOs and, <clears throat> excuse me, ETs and all this. So I don't know. You know, I, I think that a good way to look at it might be that we just consider where we're giving our power away with our own distraction because I think humanity's caught in a bear trap of attention consumption. And so if you look at it like, okay, maybe there are this, this other reptilian race or what have you, who knows? Uh, maybe some people have knowledge of that. But what I do know is I can watch where my attention goes and I can decide, and I know where, where I'm placing my attention is where my life force energy is directed. And if I can connect my attention with the intention you know, then, then I've got the two wings of the plane. So I'm of the school of, uh, I, I'm pretty exclusive with my attention, I, I guess, in the, in the, for a modern person sure. in the world. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. You know, what's the difference between, you know, feeding that and then watching the Kardashians, right? Like, I mean, I feel like, you, you know, it's the same thing almost. It's like a, another storyline, but which I think it's all manipulation anyway, to, to get, you know, catch your attention and keep it uh, to your point. But again, I think it, it should be more or less like you focusing in on your own growth and development of consciousness, right? Like, and then, but there's also the duality, right? Like if I just, if I just focus on the inside and not the outside, like you're creating a du duality. Cause like, I, I feel like, you know, it is both, it is both your external and both your internal. That is the, the divine. And for a long time, I focused on the external thinking that would bring me happiness and i that was it right like so now it's time to go in the inner inner world and clean some of that up right and really get to know who i am at the deepest level like who who is it that is behind the eyes like who, who really you know who is this being this awareness and like what are what are your likes and dislikes truly and not the ones that have been programmed at a young age or told to you that you should like or dislike that's the journey for me right now. <clears throat> and that's what I love sharing about because it's not easy because there comes a lot of discernment in that, which I think is another muscle that you need to, to flex a little bit while you're going inside, because there's a lot of things that pop up that still aren't yours. And that's where the discernment comes in to figure it out. Like for you, Charlie, when you go into that inner world, how do you discern what's yours and what's not? Yeah, it's a good question. And I like what you're speaking to. I think that, um, Fundamentally, though, the sense of doing from a state of being, you know, being rooted in your beingness or as seated in beingness as possible actually makes us much more effective in the world. You know, like a really good meditation, a really good quieting and centering where you connect with your heart and you come back, you're going to be much more effectual in the world. So, how do I practice discernment? Well, <laughs> it, with that inner experience. It, it becomes so natural is my answer that it basically in a state of clarity, you know, in that state of light, you see things exactly as they are. So I don't, I'm above the intellect. I'm above the kind of analytical structure that's based in survival. When I'm, when I'm within and connecting, when I'm in a meditative state, 
So let's say, for instance, like a thought comes up or a bodily sensation or something from the past, like a memory. It's very clear what it is, you know? Um, I think to your point, you're probably uh, implying like, well, all kinds of things can happen. You can have um, super conscious states that aren't pleasant. Um, you can have uh, downloads from the unconscious that aren't pleasant. <clears throat> well, again, it's a very rich topic here of discussion. Um, but I look at it this way. It's like if you become still enough, then you're like the Buddha where, you know, there are the 10,000 things happening. There are the gods and the angels. There's the demons. There's all this carrying on. And yet Gautama is just going, ah, the suchness, the suchness of this. So be, being in the state of seeding and seeding and seeding and seeding more into this experience of the divine, um, you're starting to resonate on a much higher frequency that's so resonant with reality that that which is illusory or that which is cooked up in your mind or something that is just a, maybe an astral uh, phenomenon or something like that, you can notice it without getting entangled in it. Mm, I love that answer. Yeah, you're, you're, I, you're the, you're, so I'm sorry, but you're the pilot that's, that only has your eyes on the horizon. So even if the plane, the plane gets flipped, you know, it's like you still have this internal sense of, okay, that's fine. I know exactly where the horizon is and nothing's distracting you towards going towards the horizon. Wow. And I have to ask you, uh, because you've had so much practice with teachers and meditation and Kundalini awakening and being struck by lightning, has any of the great teachers or avatars ever um, shown themselves to you in this reality, whether that's Sri Guru, Babaji, or Yogananda, or someone of that of that quality of consciousness have they ever you know have you ever interacted with them yes in physical reality like 3d reality not not in 3d reality in um in union in union with um in the energetic in the light in consciousness not in physical form can you name who that was or can you say what that was like mm, it, again it's it's that's something that is inexpressible. I mean, even if I try to express, express that, but I can say that there's something about this. We had a conversation, a private conversation a while back that we were touching on this. And so did my best with it. Um, see, when we're connected, you're talking particularly, say, the lineage of, uh, you know, Maha avatar of Babaji, okay? Now, he he is the the essence. He is the the beacon of light behind the whole Kriya Yoga lineage, okay? And so um, that that entity, that which I don't see as a person, I see it as a presence, as a grace. Um, that, that grace I'm connected with every day of my life. Hmm. And, um, and Yogananda, um, comes in mind, comes in energy, and and it's not just, it's like, okay, let's imagination. No, there's tons of physical, they show me um, signs and messages continuously that I don't understand that usually within 24 hours, there's the validation. So that's what helps me understand that it's not, yeah, subjective. I mean, things that I couldn't think of, things that I couldn't imagine. <laughs> Can you give me one sign that they've given you? <clears throat> Uh, no, because I, I think it's important to, to, to have some, some measure of, uh, sanctity with it. <laughs> because I, I, I respect that. I respect that. It's, it's just keep in mind, again, I've been this kind of curious camper, a guy that's been guiding souls on six continents and all that and for 30 years. And, but it was the time before the internet that I started reaching tens of thousands of people never approached it in a commercial way, never really tried to talk about my experiences. Now it's such a different world where that's really celebrated. So I'm just beginning to come out of this kind of enigmatic state of, well, people will find me and I don't, you know, want to don't push them to, you know, sure. commercial approach, you know, like, so, uh, so I, yeah, I'm not going to go into 
the personal dynamics of that. But I will say that when you merge with the divine, however you relate to it, and I think that's the amazing thing. It's like if you relate to the divinity um, as a saint or master, like we're talking about, or an avatar, or you relate to divinity as an archetypal presence like Naga or um, the um, you could say like an elemental um, the, the the gods of the winds or the sun you know or the cosmos that's how it will relate to you it will it will contact you and connect to you in exactly the form that you you personally identify with hmm. I, I think the the divine is the ultimate heoko speaking of indigenous culture you know the the trickster in the sense that you know if you you see divinity as a um as uh, say maize or corn, then the goddess of corn will come to you from within your heart and give you all kinds of knowledge that you wouldn't have otherwise. You know? Yeah, but I, I I I totally agree with you. And it's like, is it the actual archetype, or is it like the the universal cosmos consciousness that is whatever you want to call that source or god? being that for you to make a connection if that makes sense yeah again great really smart <laughs> so uh yeah i mean let's just cut to the chase of that my personal perception is the latter but yeah it's because see let's clarify that so my my sense of it my own perception of it is that yeah it's the divine dressing up in drag, taking on whatever form that you identify with. And for the very reason that we're physical beings, we, we identify like the nature of physicality is that it, um, it has boundaries. So we can only see things in terms of boundaries, in terms of contrast, in terms of light and dark and up and down. Well, what we're talking about with divinity has none of those boundaries. It's not, it's, it's all inclusive. It's an all and all is all. There's nothing that it's not, right? So if we have this limited perspective, subject, object, you know, me and the cosmos, well, it's going to come to you in a way that, you know, you, you personally identify with. Hmm. And um, these substructures of divinity, like masters and archetypal energies, are patterns of the divine. And as it's been said so many times, it, I never hear it too often, you know, it's not just that the... The drop is part of the ocean. You as the human being are part of the cosmos. It's that the cosmos is you. You know, the ocean is within the drop, right? So what you think of as Trey and what I think of as Charlie, these are very limited, um, erroneous concepts, really. And that's the realization that's available to, to all of us as human beings is we're so much greater than our, our thought and emotion and our story. Um, and you know, that's, that's the opportunity is to, is to really find out who we are, as you were saying before. I love it. How can people find out who you are? How can they connect <laughs> with you? Yeah. Yeah, that's so great. Yeah, pretty, super easy. It's just charliecastex.com. It's our website. It's the easiest way to kind of get connected to my sessions, whether it's the psychic readings, the spiritual coaching, conscious counseling, you know, where I basically have this incredible privilege to, be a personal trainer for people's souls. Mm, I love that. Yeah, that's, that's, Is there anything on your heart that you want to share right now with the audience as we close out? Mm. Yeah, great, great questions. I, I love these questions today. Yeah, sure. I would say that it's really important if you want to, people are all about effort these days, you know, like let's make an effort, you know, it's great. You know, get, like move that energy just from sheer survival into the gut center. It's like, make this happen. Yes. Okay. As you're embracing your spiritual empowerment, as you're opening up to truth, as you're transcending your historical narrative, as you're realizing your unicity, that you're connected with all things, as you're just maybe just following the rabbit trail, rabbit, uh, well, going down the rabbit hole of inspiration, don't forget to enjoy it. So many people have like a, you know, girding their loins and kind of trying to push it and happen. And want to like, I'm going to force my way to flower. Don't force the flower. Fall in love with love. Fall in love with the process of 
inquiry. Be really curious about who you are and be curious about how divine you are and how empowered you can actually be. You come in as a child, which is three essential pieces of guidance information. One is you smile. No one teaches you that. The other is you laugh. Nobody teaches that. They, they had to teach you how to use the toilet. They had to teach you how to eat, they teach you how to use language. Okay. But playing, laughing, and smiling were natural. So you're, you're, you're actually hardwired for original bliss, to really enjoy, to be blissful, to be. So we're human beings, and we want to get good at being. And part of how we get really good at being is enjoying. So with the spiritual process and, and empowerment, Make sure that you're just having fun with it. Like have, have just it should be a joy ride, you know. If it's if it sucks and it's argu- like too arduous in a in a painstaking way, you're probably doing it wrong. Hmm. It I should just that. be a total uh, blast. Really, it should be great fun to to be empowered. A blast like the Kundalini awakening. Yeah. Um. <laughs> novel and you go wow i'm alive like there's something happening that's so much bigger than me i think we start to see that um again when we get out of this like the little self that's always trying to strive push 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 there's a place for that but i call it making space for grace you know just remember like really there's a reason there's an in breath and an out breath right Hmm. yeah Yeah. like in other words it's it's we we um, we take in life, we release life. We have a conscious mind, a subconscious mind. We have masculine energy to make something happen, to be dynamic and create things. Then we have feminine energy to be receptive and to listen and to, and to be open. So we have those two wings, those two aspects. We might as well use them both. I love it. Charlie, man, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day. I know you're busy with different clients. So thank you sir for joining me and having this great conversation wow, thank you thank you that's great great to connect